Welcome to Startup Stories. I'm Haley Huey, and I'm here with Maggie Kane, founder of A Place at the Table. Welcome, Maggie. So excited to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Always a great time to chat. Um, you're just doing so many exciting things and wearing so many different hats. Um, I really wanted to hear more about your early story in building A Place at the Table. So how did you find this um, initial problem that you set out to solve? And what did it really look like to to build that organization? How did you know that this was a real possibility? Yeah. How early do you want to go back? <laughs> many years ago. Baby Maggie. Baby Maggie, <laughs> who grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina with her mom and twin sister and older brother. Um, I didn't I, know you were a twin. I'm a twin. Oh. It's the best. She's the best. Awesome. She's the best. Um, she's married to a twin too, which okay. is so interesting. Mm. Um, grew up in Raleigh, so have never really left. Um, thought I would. Um, early, early days with my mom and twin sister, we'd volunteer a lot and we would end up at the soup kitchen. And so the soup kitchen in Raleigh is fantastic. I'll talk more about that later, but they serve 300 people every single day and in an hour. So we'd be at the soup kitchen and I we'd be serving the food and I would always wonder why I'm on this side of the line. There was a little physical, there's literally a physical mm-hmm. barrier um, in between me and a kid that looked like me. Um, so I would always ask my mom, why, are, why am I on this side? And then after we were done serving at the soup kitchen, we'd go and eat at another restaurant, right? We'd go to Moe's or something similar to that and we'd sit for hours. Um, and so again, always just was curious about that. And so fast forward, I'm in high school. Um, I hated high school I I know a lot of people did but um and some people loved it but for me I was made fun of and just did not love it so I was thinking I was going to move away um very very fortunate to have gotten into NC State um ended up going to state and loved it but while I was at state I found my people I found community I started volunteering I was in a service fraternity and heard a speaker Uh, and this speaker was um came and presented to the whole group and was talking about this day shelter that he was opening And it was a day shelter working with people experiencing homelessness. So um, a shelter that saw over 100 people that came in every day and got coffee, got food, and had a a place to be. Um, I started getting involved in my junior year in college at State and knew that um, that was kind of the work I wanted to do. Um, I I, um, started to get to know so many folks that were at the day shelter. And when I graduated college, about 10 of them from the day shelter, so 10 folks who were experiencing homelessness, came to my college graduation. So they cheered me on at Chass um, in graduation. And I think we only had a few tickets, so I'm not real sure how they all got in, but somehow (laughs) they got in, uh, cheering me on. And again, it just reiterated the the work um, I wanted to do for for the rest of my life. And um, so... I ended up taking a job at this shelter and got to know folks even more. And and for me, getting to know folks is done through food, is done through coffee, drinks. Um, it's the time that you really get to spend with someone. It, food is that tool. Uh, and so um, I was getting to know lots of folks who were coming in um, off the streets, primarily folks who lived outside. And we'd I'd go eat with them to get to know them more. And I found myself back at the soup kitchen. So I found myself um, back in line at the soup kitchen, except I was on the other side. Uh, and I, we'd, we'd, we'd get our food, we'd get handed a plate, we'd sit down, we'd have to eat really quickly because um, they feed, they're feeding 300 people every hour. Um, and, and so I realized that, like, frankly, I wanted to spend more time for, with people. And, um, and also, like, I, 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 I want a choice. And so we'd go, I, would, I started taking folks out for meals. Um, and my friend John changed my life forever. Uh, we, were at the, we were at Golden Corral. He had chosen Golden Corral for the th- second or third time. And I said to John, I said, John, why have we chosen Golden Corral? I know that you're, you're living outside right now and you're super hungry. Is it because you can pile your plate on and eat a lot of food? And he said, no, I mean, this, the food is good and I'm hungry. But he said, I've chosen Golden Corral for two reasons. Here I have choice. He said, he said, people make every choice for me from where I sleep to what I eat. Here I get to choose if I want a salad or I want a waffle. And then he said the second more important one is that I feel seen here. He said, people treat me as invisible. I, here I'm seen. Someone greets me at the door. They acknowledge me. They come around and see if I need a refill. He said, I, I, I feel seen here. Uh, it was in that mic drop moment, sitting at Golden Corral with John, where I said, we've got to create a place where people feel seen and people have choice. It was also in 2014 um, in downtown Raleigh where um, folks experiencing poverty were, were somewhat getting pushed out. Um, in Moore Square Park, there were groups that were feeding in the park, and we were told that we couldn't feed in the park anymore. And so it really seemed that people with money were going this way and people with, 
without money, we're going this way. And again, there was no place that welcomed everyone together. So started building a place at the table in 2014, and we opened in January of 2018. That's amazing. I I know there are a lot of threads of early inspiration there and maybe even a light bulb moment sitting with your friend John. Yeah. I, I think having then uh, the drive and resourcefulness to go and actually build something out of that is, is what I find really inspiring. Um, but starting and building a nonprofit is incredibly challenging. Mm-hmm. Without question, there are headwinds you'll face that you didn't even see coming and you know some things will be challenging. Can you talk about some of those early obstacles that you face? So you've had a light bulb moment. You yep. know that you're really ready to build something that has those core tenets. Yep. How how did you do it and how did you weather some of the early storms? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there were so many challenges. I don't know how much time you have. <laughs> and um, so many challenges. Uh, but just, I mean, every challenge taught us so many different things. Uh, we started working on this in 2014 and it took four years. As I said, we opened in January of 2018. And um, we just had no idea what we were doing. I mean, that was challenge number one. I had never started a nonprofit before. I had never started a restaurant before. And so you're asking me to start a nonprofit and a restaurant and put them together. Um, so we really had no idea what we were doing. I um, My last name is Kane. So a lot of people think that I'm John Kane's daughter. And and John Kane, for for whoever doesn't know, is, is a very wealthy real estate developer in Raleigh. And so um, a lot of folks <laughs> thought that, that it just happened overnight for us. And that if that was true, true. I, I always tell people that if that was true, it would have been awesome, but we probably would still wouldn't be here today. We spent four years building a place at the table. We spent four years building the community that makes up a place at the table. Um, but challenge number one, I think, was fundraising. We, as a nonprofit, you've got to fundraise. We didn't have, you know, large donors immediately off the bat that we knew to come in and, and get our doors open. So um, fundraising a ch- was a challenge. And if you don't have a space, you can't really fundraise. So we didn't really know what we were asking for. Uh, and then you've got, um, you know, not finding a space. We started working with different real estate agents early in 2014, 2015. And I I remember so many different calls from people who said, oh, no, we don't, we don't want you in our space, right? Different building managers. And so finding a space was really tricky. But then if you don't have money, you can't find a space and you don't have, and you don't have a space you can't really fundraise. So we were kind of like that chicken and egg saying we were stuck. And um, so that was really, that, that was really difficult. And then I think the third thing would be that it's just such an unusual concept. So getting people to understand it was hard. Um, a lot of folks with, were thinking we were going to be a soup kitchen. A lot of folks were thinking that, um, you know, this place would never work, that people would take advantage. And so getting folks to understand the concept, um, you know, didn't help with us finding a space or didn't help with us fundraising. And so um, we, we we had several challenges um, from early days, and we still do. And every challenge. Challenge, I mean, I swear teaches us something. I um I, I mean it's that saying like when one door closes, another one opens. That's been that's been the truth of a place at the table the whole entire time. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I think you're totally right too. You were having to educate people not only on the problem so that they really connected with it. Also, um, a pay what you can model isn't as common, right? No. People understand restaurants, right. they understand soup kitchens. Right. To be able to mash up and create that perfect solution. Um, <clears throat> I say perfect solution, right? You right. you continue to point to iterating on that all the yeah. time. Um, there's no just single linear path where you solve this problem and then yep. the next thing is easy and apparent and easy to fix. Um, so I think what I have really been struck by at A Place at the Table is just the sense of community and the joy yes. that you experience when you walk through the doors. And that's through the volunteers. That's through people who are there getting a meal that otherwise might not. It's the people working at A Place at the Table. It's everybody who's yeah. taking part. So um you know, strong call to action. If you haven't been to a place at the table, Thank now you. is the time. Don't come go another week. <laughs> also, the food is so good. So yeah. come eat with us. The food is so good. I, I get the the black bean wrap oh, with, every time oh I'm there. Oh my gosh, yeah. So with good. barbecue chips or tortilla chips. Oh, definitely the barbecue chips. The barbecue chips, yeah. yeah. So good. Yeah, our staff makes like just everything on the menu is phenomenal. So you can't miss it. Yeah. But thank you. I, I I do think like what makes table so special is the joy you experience. Like as soon as you walk in the door, it may feel really chaotic. It may feel like it may feel like you're walking into a disaster, but there's still so much joy and warmth and we call it beautiful chaos. 
So Maggie, we've talked a little bit about the origin story for A Place at the Table. It's so exciting. It's growing. Can you walk us through what A Place at the Table looks like, works like today? I know you have an army of volunteers, mm -hmm. um, but, but how do you make A Place at the Table successful every day? An awesome team of people. <laughs> um, so I'll place the table just to back us up a little bit. It looks and feels like a normal restaurant. So when you walk in, um, you see fun photos on the wall. You hear good music. You smell really good food. And you get up to the register. That's when you notice that we're a little different than any other restaurant that you go to. And you see suggested pricing. You see folks with volunteer name tags around. And that's when you see that that we're pay what you can. So all of our prices on the menu are pay what you can and, and have a suggested price. And so if you were to get avocado toast and bacon, we'd give you a suggested price of 9 or $10. You could choose to pay that price. You could pay more and pay it forward. So our staff make a living wage, so we don't take tips. So anything that you tip or donate above goes back into paying it forward for someone else. If you can't pay the suggested price, you can pay less with us. We know that some weeks are harder than others, and you can just afford less, and that's totally cool with us. And um, then you can also volunteer for your meal. So if you can't pay anything, you can come in and volunteer with us, which I'll talk about in a second. I know you mentioned volunteers. Um, and then we also feed families for free. So um, we feed a lot of families for free that are coming in needing a meal. And then the last option, there's so many ways, um, the last option is our place cards. They look and feel like credit cards or gift cards. And so those get handed out to about 20 or 30 nonprofit partners, feed the pack food, Food Pantry at NC State keeps our place cards um, so folks that need a meal, students or staff, can go get one and come back and eat with us. Um, our mission is community and good food for all regardless of means. So we say we're using that good food as a tool towards creating community. We have a full-time staff. Everything is chef prepared. Everything's made to order. The food, as I said, is phenomenal. The biggest, like the hardest thing in all of our days is, is deciding what we're actually going to order that day because um, everything is really good. And so our staff... Um, um, just you all, all of our staff are making the food making the coffee making your lattes making the pretty latte art in, in your in your coffee um, and then volunteers help us do everything else um, we see anywhere from a uh, hundred to 250 people a day who um, are are eating with us so we say we're fighting food insecurity but we're really fighting community insecurity and creating a place where we would belong and feel a part of and experience that joy that we were talking about and um, and so volunteers help us do that and help create that community Community that we all need in our life. We have folks that volunteer weekly with us. Um, they come in every Tuesday morning from 8 to 11. Uh, we also have folks that sign up online and then we also have folks that just show up and volunteer for their meal like I just like I just mentioned. All volunteers are doing the same thing. They are greeting you at the door. They are busing tables. They are um, bringing your coffee to your table, doing dishes, doing all the things to support our staff. Um, and, and as I said, it it is beautiful chaos around there every single day, but it works. And uh, volunteers, we we could not function without volunteers. That's amazing. So Maggie, tell us, what advice do you have for aspiring early stage founders or even those people who really want to make a difference in their community? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so many things. I I – I said a little bit earlier that I had no idea what I was doing, and I still don't. But I think what's so beautiful about entrepreneurship, I think what's so beautiful about starting a business is you're not alone. And so I think my, my biggest piece of advice is don't do it alone. Um, just because you're an entrepreneur, just because you have this great idea, doesn't mean you have to do it alone. It's so much better in community. I would not be here today if I did not have 25 people on our team that is at, you know, at the restaurant right now making it happen, if I didn't have an accountant and a lawyer and all these folks that I've gotten involved. Um, early in 2014, I realized that I really wasn't good at a lot. Still not. Um, but there are amazing people that I am surrounding myself with that are. And so I reached out to someone who had accounting at you know experience and, and said, okay, can you help me write a budget and teach me how to write a budget? I reached out to a lawyer who had legal experience and that I, ha I couldn't even read a contract. I didn't even, had never seen a contract in my life. <laughs> and I said, can you help me walk, can you walk me through this contract? And so I think that's the thing is we're not not supposed to be good at it all and I think a lot of us think we're supposed to be um, but we're not and so find you know find and, and nail down what you're good at and what you love doing and then find other people to surround yourself with that um, you know that, that are good at other things and and I think the other thing is is then ask for help don't be afraid to ask for help I um, early on I again going back to I thought I had to do it all but no other people want to help you other people want to be a part of what you're doing because it's so cool so don't be afraid to ask 
ask. And if they say no, ask again. And if they say no, ask again. I have asked many people, you know, investors, donors, people who are volunteering with us, I've asked them for things and they've said no. And then I just try again. And, and I think that that's, that's the beautiful thing is like you're asking them to join in the wonderful work you're doing. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah, I think that's such great advice. I mean, gosh, I need an accountability partner to get me to the gym. Imagine mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. the heavy, heavy lifting you're doing yeah. when you're actually building something that, you know, it could be a new business that you're starting. It could be a community-based project. I think yeah. there are broad applications all around. It could even be kind of early in your work working for another company. Like you're spinning up 100%. something that creates value, right? It's really important to always just press pause and reflect what's working, mm-hmm. what's not. Mm-hmm. And we love to talk about success. You know, we love to talk about when things are going really, really well and there's so many things that are bright and shiny with the place at the table. Can you share more with us about anything that might have been a failure, a misstep, a lesson learned, and kind of what did you do as a result of that? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. Um, for table, I'd say what we've realized over the the um, past few months is that we have not been able to go as as relational as our mission says, that community and food, that getting to know people, that connect, you know, really loving them and then connecting them to the resources we need, where they need we're seeing so many people come in every day that we we found that it's it's becoming somewhat transactional and so we don't want that that's not what our mission that's not what we set out eight years ago but that's that's definitely not what we continue to set out to be um, and so we have definitely what I've realized is I have definitely I'll, I'll speak for myself personally I've, I've like misstepped in that I've lost the mission a little bit I've I've been running around the restaurant just trying to push out meals we've been, we've been I've been out there fundraising trying to make money for table to grow table to build what's next all the beautiful things that we get the opportunity to do but I've I've walked right past Randall and Josh and Mary folks that I love so deeply and I haven't asked how they're doing I haven't asked how their daughter who was in the hospital was doing and that is a misstep and that is not what we ever set out sought out to do and so I you know I've really just been focusing more and more the past couple weeks of what is our mission and how how does you know sometimes we think as founders we think as owners of companies that we got to be bigger and better and we got to scale and we've got to you know we got to franchise our concepts in reality, maybe it's okay to just like be okay with what you're doing and go deeper and love people more. And um, and so we're pausing and we're experimenting with different things of what it would look like. Like how do we go deeper? How do we get to know people more? How do we connect, you know, Mary to – the place she may need to go for her dentist or her what uh, an appointment for her daughter, whatever it is. Um, and so I, I just think sometimes we think we have to be the best next thing and keep growing that next thing and franchise it and scale. But in reality, maybe we just like are okay with what we're doing and just go deeper with what we're doing. Yeah, I think it's a powerful lesson too because – conventional wisdom. If this were, you know, an early stage tech concept, we'd say, wow, you've hit product market fit now, you know, like let's just grow and scale as quickly as humanly possible. And, you know, sometimes that's the right philosophy. There are organizations where that really works. Um, But I do think having the wisdom of knowing what your people most need, and that's the people on your team, that's the people you serve in the community. Um, How do you just refocus and dig a lot deeper so that you, you're able to accomplish the value that you set out to create? 100%. Hundred percent. And how do you how do you care for your staff first, and yeah. then have your staff care for everyone else that's coming in there, and care for them well, yeah. um, and love them, and and figure out what they need. And so um, I think that at least for us, again, yeah, like you said, we can't speak for everyone. It, it depends on what your business is, but um, we are really figuring out how we can truly love our community so well and do what do what our community needs. Again, going back to asking what they need and. They need us to to be a present in their life, and they need us to be a place where they they can come and and um, know that we've we've got their back. Yeah, you know, there are so many exciting programs and features with a place at the table, and you know, you as executive director are in charge of you know keeping the doors open and making sure that you can provide a path to growth. So. How do you do that, and yeah. and how do you ensure future growth for Table? Yeah, absolutely. So a pay what you can restaurant, you would think, wow, they're um, probably not making a lot of money, and you are right about that. <laughs> um, you, if that's what you were thinking, um, we so we generate we only generate about twenty or thirty percent of revenue um, 
of our of our annual budget in the cafe revenue. Um, so we do, we definitely 100% rely on people coming in and dining with us um, and ordering a latte, ordering a cinnamon roll, eating with us, but then we fundraise the rest. So we are, um, we're definitely, a, you know, a, we're that restaurant nonprofit. So we're generating some revenue, um, but they do say that that restaurants are nonprofits in itself. So um, we are, but we're actually a nonprofit restaurant. So we're even less. <laughs> um, and so we generate, like I said, 20 to 30 percent in the in the restaurant um, but then we have to fundraise the rest and so that's outside donors that's individuals um, that's foundations grants sponsorships things like that um, that that makes you know a place a table what it is so we do we have to go out we have to fundraise we have to um, really spread the table mission um, so that folks can support it from you know near in town to to afar yeah yeah, that's great advice. And I think you guys also have a gala or a fundraising event each year. Giant party. Yeah, we'll call it. Yes. And so that helps us. That helps us uh, raise money as well for our for our budget. But um, it takes every person to make this place happen. We said whether you're dining with us, donating, volunteering, you're making it happen. And um, so so we it, it takes a whole team of people. Yeah. So Maggie, my last question for you today is kind of let's let's be future focused here. You guys are doing exciting things yes. at table. Um, you now have a mobile concept. You have a food truck that's yes. become part of a place at the table community. How's that going? And what are you really excited about as you think about the future? Yes, we are so excited. So I, I'd say first, we're so excited to, as I, I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, is going deeper. We're excited to to continue to, to connect with our community, know more folks and more community members that are coming into a place at the table. Um, so we're really excited to continue to do the work we're doing in downtown Raleigh um, and then we're excited about what we're doing next of the, uh, with the travel and table and mobile food truck um, if I I mean I would I would be wealthy if I had a dollar for every time someone told me 10 years ago you should just start a food truck instead of opening a restaurant I said we're never gonna start a food truck now we're here we're starting a food <laughs> truck um, but we're really excited because a place the table I, I've mentioned a few times that it's really packed in there and it's beautiful chaos it is crowded we are somewhat at capacity capacity each day at any given time and so we just started to think what what else can we do um how else can we support the greater community we're going to still really focus in on what we're doing at a place at table but we're going to hire another team and more staff so we can we can we have the opportunity to employ more people we have the opportunity to love more people out in the community we have the opportunity to um you know go and, and do outreach and show our mission of community and food to folks that don't know about a place at table in downtown Raleigh so we're really pumped we hired our general manager for the truck and he is building the team and um we just can't wait to be on the road hoping we can come to NC State one day um and um um, who knows, maybe pack a palooza or something like that. But um, we are excited about what's next. We're excited to to continue to um, share our mission with people. Yeah, that's amazing. My my gears are already turning for all the ways that we can partner yes. and just invite in. You, you called it Travel and Table? The Travel and Table mobile, mobile truck. The Travel and Table, you heard it here yes. first. I think that's so exciting. You know, it just goes to show you can create a ton of value. You can do exciting things. But, you know, you're you're going to continue to iterate and grow what you're doing. Yes. And you're going to adapt to the world around you. And there are new opportunities. And we're just so excited to follow along and see what happens with this next chapter. So, thank you. We are excited best too. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Maggie. Maggie, thanks so much for the time today. It's been great just to chat more about lessons learned. Um, I feel inspired. I'm ready to go to lunch at table tomorrow. Yes, please. Yes, we'll see you tomorrow uh, for cinnamon all your rolls. Friends. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. right. If you've never been, you know, make it a goal to go this week, go this yes. month, check it out for yourself. Yeah. It's something that come you will feel as soon as you walk in the door. Yeah. Come see us and ask us if you need help in whatever you're building next. We would love to, to as you said earlier, how important mentors and community is. Like we at A Place of Table want to be your community too. So um, know we are there and we are just, a, a, you know, a cinnamon roll away. Yeah. That's amazing. Thanks so much, Maggie. Thanks for having me. 